Welcome to this week's Clips of Time, everybody. My name is Tess Will. I am the Visitor Services Coordinator at the Tobacco Farm Life Museum in Kenley, North Carolina. Um, this week I'm hosting our Clips of Time. Um, been to our museum, then you know that we have a really cute <laughs> little uh, medical exhibit. Um, medical history is actually especially of mine because I actually worked at the Country Doctor Museum, another local museum um, in the area for about three years. So I have a pretty long background in medical history, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. Um, our exhibit features artifacts from doctors who practice in Kenley. And Kenley was really special because it actually had four doctors in town, and that was really uncommon for such a small town like Kenley. Um, in the rural south. Um, so if you, whenever we reopen, maybe in July, I hope that you guys come and visit and check everything out. Um, so today I'm gonna to talk about the history of germ theory um, throughout time, um, and then read a small newspaper clipping from 1925. Um, if you can't hear me or anything, this uh, will be in a blog on our website, so you can find it on to, um, Tobacco Farm Life museum.com slash blog. For a long time, humans had have had a basic understanding that something unseen caused disease. And though not always known by this name, the miasmic theory prevailed from the fourth century all the way up until the 19th century. Um, the miasmic theory was the belief that bad air was the cause of illness. And bad air could have been anything from like swamp gas to the smell from rotting foods and trash, or even later in the 19th century when we had pollution. Um, so those dirty, stinky air, that's where all of your sickness and germs lived. And that's how it infected you. Um, and it's really easy to want to criticize the miasmic theory as kind of silly or primitive. It doesn't really make sense, but it was a theory based off of observation. And I don't think that um, miasma is any weirder um, than germ theory today because miasma at least was based on um, part of your senses. You could sense it, you could smell it, and even see it if it was smoke or something like that. Um, so no less strange than germs that are invisible to our human eye. Um, and so since it was a theory based in logic, um, it's why it probably lasted so f for so very long. Um, like I said, it was started in the fourth century by Hippocrates. So that's where we get the Hippocratic Oath that doctors take. Um, he was a physician in ancient Greece and he was the first one to write about bad air. So miasma theory was very long lasting. And things didn't really begin to change until the 19th century. And that was actually in the midst of a different pandemic, not the one we're going through now, um, but it was in the midst of a cholera pandemic. Um, so Dr. John Snow uh, was the uh, first physician to really explore what it means to have germs. He didn't believe in the miasmic theory so much, so Dr. Snow was actually the first, he pioneered the field of epidemiology to prove that cholera was not caused by miasma, but by contaminated water. Um, Snow was unconvinced that miasma was the cause of cholera. And in 1854, he was given a chance to prove his theory. Um, there was an outbreak in a um, little area of West London called Soho. Um, and he was able to interview all of the residents in the area who had gotten cholera or people um, he, they knew had gotten cholera, and he was able to trace it to one single pump, a water pump on Broad Street. So um, because of all of his hard work, he was able to definitively prove um, that cholera was caused by water or spread by water. So he published his theory in 1855, but it wasn't really well received by the medical community, and his theory wasn't credited until after his death because he actually died not too long after um, he published this theory. But almost at the same time, another pair of men were working towards germ theory. Um, Louis Pasteur, who I'm probably mostly familiar with, um, and Joseph Lister should also be recognized for their work towards eliminating the theory of miasma. So Snow's work and Pasteur's theory that fermentation was caused by microorganisms helped inform Lister's theory. So Lister was a surgeon, a uh, British surgeon, who distrib 
Um, he was really disturbed by the amount of patients who were killed by sepsis after surgery. Um, so after a lot of study and practice, and he was like a head surgeon, so he had a lot of practice in it, um, he was convinced that sepsis was caused by microorganisms transported by the air. Um, he began using carbolic acid to dress wounds to great success. Um, he would even spray it in the air um, just to make sure everything was clean. Um, but just like Snow, his work was discredited initially in the medical community, especially in America. The Americans did not like his theory at all. Um, they much preferred to believe in the miasma theory. And that's probably because doctors had a hard time taking it seriously. Um, because accepting germ theory meant that the physicians had to accept that their patients often died by their own hands. So um, your unwashed hands performing a surgery is causing the death of your patient even though you were trying to save their lives. Um, and that was definitely hard for doctors to accept. And like I said, miasma is that tangible kind of thing you can blame something on. So. By the time of the American Civil War, doctors were slowly coming to accept germ theory. Um, Lister's work, plus Florence Nightingale's hand-washing campaigns, gained a lot of traction during the war. Um, Nightingale was really all about keeping um, like hospital tents and stuff clean and making sure your hands were clean. And though they didn't know why all of these efforts were working, um, it did. So. Um, it wasn't until a bit later when they started using microscopes um, to actually look at bodily tissues and stuff and making more powerful microscopes that you could see the microbes. Um, but by the 20th century, germ theory had mostly been accepted in the medical community, though a lot was still unknown about a variety of diseases. So throughout the 20th century, there was plenty of different newspaper segments which were written in order to educate the public about um, different health matters and hygiene, all sorts of stuff. Um, so an, I'm going to read from an article in the Alamance Gleaner. It's from Alamance County in North Carolina, I think in Graham, North Carolina. And this one was published in January 15 of 1925. It was entitled, Why Some Germs Are Invisible. And this was going to help the common person understand the scientific advancements that were coming in germ theory. Because even in 1925, rural areas wouldn't have been up to date with certain um, advancements because it's just not what they needed in their daily lives. So I'm going to read just a bit from this. It's actually from a series called How to Keep Well by Dr. Frederick Green. He was the editor of Health, which was a magazine. So, um, an invisible germ cannot be studied. This means that until a germ is made visible, there is no way of knowing where it could be found in the body, how it affects various organs, how it gets out of the body or in what form, what it lives on outside of the body, whether it is carried by animals or insects, or how it gets back to the human body or and how it can be controlled and the infection of human healthy persons be avoided. So 100 years ago, smallpox and yellow fever were equally monstru monstrous. Um, no one knew the causes of either disease. No one knew whether they were carried by animals or insects or whether contact with a sick person would cause it. Today we know only mosquitoes carry yellow fever, so we disregard everything else in controlling this disease. We suspect everything about the smallpox patient, just as our forefathers did 100 years ago. Someday the germ of smallpox will be found and then it will be as easy to stamp out as this disease, um, as it is to control yellow fever. So that's just a little bit of the article. Um, it's linked in our blog if you want to read the whole thing. And there's a nice one under it about malaria. It's kind of fun, very similar, um, small uh, yellow fever. So the article would have helped farming families who had l typically little education and no access to libraries um, be up to date about germ theory and the kind of progress made to eradicating certain diseases. Um, it would also have probably inspired hope in a family who would have dealt with diseases like smallpox firsthand. Um, smallpox, since then, has been eradicated from the world due to hygienic changes and the smallpox vaccine. 
Um, this is the only eradicated disease in the world, so that's why we still vaccinate today. Um, but in this day and age, I think it's more important than ever to remember the accomplishments of scientists and physicians who came before us. Um, through the discovery of germs, the human race has defeated many of the diseases that once plagued the earth. And with time and proper hand washing, I think we will also defeat what ails us. So thank you for coming today, guys. It was really exciting to have everyone here. Um, Please feel free to like and share the video um, and we will be back next week, Friday at 2 o'clock with another segment. I think Miss Melody, um, our executive director, will probably be taking that one. Um, but if you liked this one, just let us know what kind of topics you would like to hear from in the future, okay? Thank you guys.